Hey there, welcome everyone to another episode of the Cosmic Matrix podcast with your hosts Bernhard Günther and Laura Matsu. This is our 10th episode and today's topic is do you really want to awaken? Question mark. So this is a big topic about awakening, what does it mean, the process of awakening ties into other topics of sincerity and integrity, the woke culture out there and many other things we'll be addressing and discussing. And to set the tone of this episode, we'd like to start off with a quote by Adya Shanti from his book, The End of Your World. The truth of the matter is, is that most people who say they want awakening don't actually want to awaken. They want their version of awakening. What they actually want is to be really happy in their dream state. And that's okay if that's as far as they've evolved. But the real, sincere impulse towards enlightenment is something that goes far beyond the desire to make our dream state better. It's an impulse that is willing to subject itself to whatever is needed in order to wake up. The authentic impulse towards enlightenment is that internal prayer asking for whatever it is that will bring us to a full awakening, no matter whether it turns out to be wonderful or terrible. It is an impulse that puts no conditions on what we have to go through. This authentic impulse can be a bit frightening because when you feel it, you know it is real. When you have to, when you have let go of all conditions, when you have let go of how you want your own awakening to be and what you want the journey to be like, you have to let go of your illusion of control. Enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or becoming happier. Enlightening is a crumbling, crumbling away of untruth. It's a scene through the facade of pretense. It's a complete eradication of everything we imagine to be true. In my experience, everyone will say they want to discover the truth right up until they realize that the truth will rob them of their deepest held ideas, beliefs, hopes, and dreams. The freedom of enlightenment means much more than the experience of love and peace. It means discovering a truth that will turn your view of self and life upside down. For one who is truly re ready, this will be unimaginably liberating. But for one who is still clinging in any way, this will be extremely challenging indeed. How does one know if they are ready? One is ready when they are willing to be absolutely consumed, when they are willing to be fuel for a fire without end. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. So, yeah, this quote was also a big theme in at our retreat we just returned from. Mm. We just got back uh, from the Peruvian high jungle, staying in... Uh, beautiful eco-lodge, the Shirapa Manta, our friends in Peru who own this eco-lodge, and we had the retreat for ourselves, and Laura and I hosted it. Uh, we had eight participants from all over the world and engaged in quite deep work. You know, we gave talks and workshops, talks, you know, we all write about, I write about on my website from more the bigger picture perspective, the matrix control system, the bigger picture of the evolution of consciousness, and to the micro perspective, the individual process of quote-unquote awakening, self-work, psychologically, spiritual, esoterically. And the big part of, of, of the retreat was definitely the embodiment process to get into our bodies through meditation practices, yoga practices, various embodiment practices. And it was a beautiful fusion of um, bringing our work together, really mm -hmm. the yin and yang, the male and female energy. Um, but it was really interesting, you know, at those retreats, especially this retreat, uh, the group energy, the group synergy, mm. right, of the people bringing, coming together and based on their intention where they add and bringing their sincerity to the work of what, you know, do you truly want to awaken? Do you really want to burn in the fire of transmutation mm. that really sets the stage of how, quote unquote, productive the work is? Yeah. And we are, you know, we're not doing the work for others. We are facilitators, right? We're presenting something. We're helping others, guiding in a sense but we're not healing others. We're not making other people wake. We're just providing a platform. Yeah. But the really important part is that how people are sincere in their own work. And that was really beautiful during this retreat. Um, 
to see how everyone was very sincere in their own process. And that also really created this safe container, this amazing synergy and energy between the group, which helped each other because it, it created a lot of empathy and compassion. And we noticed that, noticed that at the beginning, like at any retreat at the beginning, everybody's a bit more shy and introverted, doesn't want to share much. And it's obviously we're in the middle of the jungle. I didn't find that, though. I found that people the, were very vulnerable in the uh, beginning. Right, right away, yeah, they're slight, you know, it had then become way more some people deep, opened up more as time up. went on it's true at the beginning at the opening share and there many were right away getting into their stuff what they need to confront people mm. even some cried broke down crying already yeah so that was very special about this group in particular but over the time you know when we engage in these embodiment and especially the meditation practices you also were guiding and teaching and people were able to drop deeper you know into themselves and that's really a part of you know you're going deeper and really sincere in the awakening process when you do meditation sincerely it brings up your stuff yeah right? suppressed emotions traumas wounds but then especially in the group process as people are sharing it kind of inspires other people you know it's also a good example for what i've talked we have talked about before that you can do self-work by yourself only that much right you need like guide not only just guidance or help but also mirroring assistance but especially doing this work in person with others creates this container where you just don't get which you all can sometimes get trapped in our own uh, process tunnel vision right and then when other people share as well this stuff you kind of recognize yourself in others it's like oh this person is just like me suffering in their own way or similar and we can see in each other so it creates this mutual compassion empathy so we can go deeper together mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautifully said. And I think also this group process is so important just because a lot of our core wounds, at least that we know in this lifetime, happened in relationship. And so it can only be healed in relationship. There was some part, you know, when our, there was some point in our childhood where our essences weren't reflected back to us by our parents or our caregivers. So when we can be our true selves around other people and be in our true essences and have them be connecting to us on our, with their essences, that's actually what creates this deeper healing and safety. I think especially you wrote an article about this, about loneliness on the path. It's, it's very easy to feel like we're really alone in this. I know that for me, that was one of the most difficult things for me to deal with. Um, that's actually what created this opening up to the divine. But I, similar to what you said, I got caught in my own tunnel vision of doing like self work on myself and being like, oh, I'm too sensitive. I can't deal with the world. And that's my challenge that why that's why I ended up moving into an intentional community. Because I was like, I, I just have to be around people, you know, and when we I think that the one of the issues of, of Western culture is like it's it's been really focused on the individual, which is great. You know, we really we need to individualize to find our own true soul purpose. But it's been done in this neurotic way where it's like, you know, we're missing this community. Even growing up, I used to be able to knock on my neighbor's doors and ask for to borrow things. Now, if you do that, people will be like trying to charge you money or be like, don't talk to me. Like, oh, my God, never mind if you did it to your neighbors. Like, um, so that's that's the thing that we're missing is a sense of community. And we live increasingly in this very isolated culture. And I think even people in the spiritual community, especially engaging on social media, like we can get very isolated and that doesn't help us. So these retreats are the perfect opportunity to create, make these like soul connections. Like maybe we live in a small town and maybe uh, the resources are limited. So we can, you know, everyone who is at this retreat is like going to be friends for, I feel a really long time. I see them commenting on each other's stuff on social media. Even more than friends in some cases. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and that creates a safety to know that you're not alone and to know that you can, you have someone to reach out to if you need, if you need to talk to someone. So, and I think that just bringing it back to this topic, this is this crucial part of the awakening process. Like you cannot... Like, it's not about you being more woke than other people. In fact, like, when you truly awakening, awake, start to awaken, you start to see yourself in literally everyone. Like, even someone who's, like, you, you know, you, I don't feel we look, we quote unquote, start looking down on people. I feel the more enlightened you get, the more you just start seeing yourself in everyone. I mean, literally everyone. So that's the important part of this awakening process. 
So maybe let's go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. I wanted just to, when we talk about uh, or ask the questions, do you really want to awaken? Like mm. Adya Shanti said, you know, we also need to consider what does it mean to mm. awake? What is awakening? And we see this word is very used or abused in this day and age in social media and spirituality communities. Everybody says, I'm awake this, I'm awake that. Or this whole woke culture, right? Where people claim I'm awake. And then, as you just alluded to, we can fall into the trap of superiority mm. and look down of people which we think are not awake. And the moment you do that, you're actually not awake. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know? So there are also different stages of awakening. What I've noticed, people claim to be awake. And I've done the same. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, not taking myself out of the equation. You know, you can be quote unquote awake in a relative sense of um, being awake of like the outside world, the 3D world, in terms of what's happening, of the corruption, the distortion, the lies by government, 9/11. You know, conspiracies on some level, seeing through the facade, through the lies of politics. <clears throat> Excuse me, but being told by social media, I mean mainstream media, and so on and so forth. And then people claim, oh, I'm awake, I can see through this. But that's not truly mean, it doesn't mean to be awake from a true esoteric perspective, right? This is just a certain stage to like your perceptions cleansed. You see, maybe you start to see reality without rose colored glasses on. You see through the social cultural conditioning to a degree. But to be awake in the true spiritual esoteric word of the meaning of the word literally means union with the divine to be in touch with essence mm. right to see god in in others and yourself to experience complete oneness not intellectually philosophically but on your entire being mm. and it's also beyond any emotional feeling of bliss love or this peak experience which, which people also mistake for quote-unquote awakening so it's really important to understand what does it mean to be awake to be awake and essentially is we all who are engaged in this work it's a process of it's a process of awakening mm -hmm. and it also ties into truth what is truth and also ties into sincerity and integrity yeah and, and maybe we can talk about our own like personal journeys as well because you can kind of see how we've gone through different stages ourselves. I know for myself, like, I think it was like age 13, even though this magazine, by the way, is completely distorted now and corrupt. But I found it was I was staying at a friend's dad's apartment and I found ad busters and I saw all the lies of the media. And I was like, holy shit, like I, I just it made me realize, see the world and the media in a completely different way and realize how much I had been programmed. And that happened to me very young. So then Obviously, you know, I turn into this like teenage anarchist. I start hating the world, you know, I want to like fight the government. And then, you know, moving further, like I can see that phase, you know, I went into like a deep depression, drug addiction, whatever, the dark, the super long dark night of the soul. And then when I started, basically, I had a experience of God. And then I started to engage in a spiritual practice and do psychological self-work. Again, it's a different phase, like getting caught in like environmentalism, you know, not to say that we shouldn't care about the planet, but I was, again, there was something unhealed in me. I felt um, this pain and suffering, which I wanted to control the outer world, telling people I, went, I got caught up in the whole vegan movement, telling people, oh my God, like if you're not vegan, you're destroying the planet. And so then different stages, it's like, okay, what's that anger? What's that rage? Or I had to, I had to, I had to discover that. So, and then even, even further, you know, like doing my own spiritual work, I realize it's about this embodiment practice. So you can see, you know, there's going to be these different phases as well as, as well as these different levels of consciousness. Like we think that a lot of Westerners just think that there's just enlightenment and that's it. But in like, in Sanskrit, they have varying, they have different names for these different levels of consciousness. There's basic, there's basically levels of samadhi and higher consciousness as well. And Sri Aurobindo um, refers to these levels of consciousness as well. So I'm just going to read them really quickly. If you'd like to know more about them, check out the book, Our Many Selves, which really lays them out in the beginning. So there's the unconscious, unconscious, unconscient. <laughs> is how he says it, but that's basically the unconscious. You know, there's a subconscious, which is some subconscious, the physical, the vital, which is like our desires, uh, the mind, the higher mind, the illumined mind, intuition, overmind, supermind, and Sakshitananda. And Sakshitananda, and I'm taking this definition from Speaking Tree, a website, 
is basically a Sanskrit compound form, which being translated as eternal consciousness bliss or absolute consciousness bliss, consisting of existence and thought and joy. So sat means truth, existence or pure being, chit means consciousness, and ananda means bliss. Yeah, and that's important to understand that this uh, state of being uh, in in Jirobindo's cosmology from integral yoga surpasses this this last stage of Sitchananda. Sachitananda. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. Excuse yeah. my uh, mispronunciation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anybody, I can highly recommend uh, Sri Aurobindo's work of integral yoga. And the best introduction to his work is a book written by one of his students, or uh, also who has been living with the mother, Sri Aurobindo's partner. His name is Salprem, and he wrote a book, Sri Aurobindo or the Adventures or, or the Adventure of Consciousness. And it's a beautiful fusion of summary of Sri Aurobindo's work infused with uh, Sri Aurobindo's life and his own experiences and levels of awakening, stages of awakening Sri Aurobindo went through. And as even um, in his own life, he also achieved Nirvana, Samadhi, which a lot of people, especially Eastern uh, uh, seekers, see as, as an end stage or as the enlightenment experience to just live in nirvana and samadhi. But even as Sri Aurobindo experienced and achieved this state, he realized this is not the end. Yeah. This is actually just the intermediate stage and can be actually a trap to stay there. Oh, for right? sure. Right, to get yeah. be like even uh, tempted to stay in this blissful state of being when they're actually way h higher levels and here to then through his own inner process then pierce through what he called the supramental consciousness and higher levels, the overmind, mm. right? And it keeps going and going. And also we, in, in our evolutionary state of consciousness, ultimately, we are still, even as Sri Aurobindo talked about, as a human being, we are in a, in a transition, state, transition state, ultimately, maybe in thousands of years after we have worked through this dark age, so to speak, and really progress in the evolution of consciousness essentially we'll be also able to present death and not needing to you know incarnate reincarnate and so on and, and actually experience deep phys um, physiological changes yeah. but again this whole idea of enlightenment goes way beyond of just being in an you know constant state of bliss yeah and i just i just wanted to reflect because i did have experiences of this bliss and It lasted for hours when I was in India. Um, so it was it was really hard to describe, but it was very similar. Uh, the only analogy is very much like being on MDMA, except infused with peace. Like I was just, I was just, I was like pure love for everything, but very at peace with anything, not questioning anything and not any doubt. And one of the, one of the things I realized maybe this is my own like discomfort is I was like, this is unmanageable to be in the world that way was one thing I realized. because I was like, how am I, you know, going to function in my everyday life. But then again, I also, I also realized, you know, that was just a, basically a peak experience as well. And, and, and to not chase after that. And also I truly believe that some of these experiences are, um, They used to be easier to access in older times when we didn't have like Wi-Fi and EMFs and all the temptations of the modern world. And then India and Asia in general has this rich spiritual history and India as well. You know, like a lot of these places where I was meditating were basically supercharged because people have been meditating there for years, you know, so it's not and, and you know, it's it's actually, you know, I don't want to make it sound Uh, ex super accessible, but to be honest, I really truly feel if you're sincere, it's not that hard to access those states. But the true work is bringing those these higher states of being into everyday life in an embodied way, and that's where the work gets really difficult. Like you can go to the mountains and the Himalayas and meditate in these places where these enlightened masters meditated for years. They're basically supercharged with energy, you know. So if you're able to tune into that and you're sincere in your meditation process, you can tune into that. But it's really the task is to bring it into the Western world. And it's similar to this article both you and I shared on social media about how the importance of the psychological work and the spiritual work for Westerners, because Westerners deal with this unique set of problems that actually don't exist in these Eastern cultures as exactly. much. Um, and so that's really where our work as Westerners is, is like we have many psychological complexes that didn't exist in these times. Yeah. Just to reference the article, it's, uh, the article is called The Psychology of Awakening, mm -hmm. written by John Wellwood, who also originally coined the term spiritual bypassing. 
And for members of our community, this, by the way, is the first hour uh, free for everyone. The second hour will be only available for members. And we have on the membership forum also um, posted this article in this psychology section. Yeah. But yeah, in that article, he also talks, John Wellwood, that it's easy to have, quote unquote, easy spiritual realizations yeah. somewhere out there, you know, even peak experience in Peru, ayahuasca and the Sacred Valley, or even our retreat anywhere. You can, mm. it's easy to do this work, especially in nature. You're supported by nature away from your everyday concerns. You're being taken care of, food provided. So it's easy to focus and concentrate. So it's easy to have these self, these realizations, but then it, as John Wellwood pointed out, and you just said, it's important to put it into actual to actualize it, which means integrate it in everyday life, mm -hmm. and not forget and the work and keep doing it. It's a twenty four seven job, yeah. and it's easy when you have these experiences. Someone you go back into your everyday life, a family, friends, your job, matrix temptations, infusions, your ruts, your mechanical habits, and back your back into your old self, and all the ego problems come up again. But that's when it's needed, right there to be consistent with the work. Yeah. And especially, like you said, for us, it's important to combine psychological with spiritual work. Both go hand in hand. You can get lost in psychological work just doing it by yourself. As Sri Yobindo said, you, uh, he was you know, somewhat critical of just doing psychological work alone. He was especially critical of Freud for uh, reasons that are very understandable. But he called it like just digging in the mud in the darkness in the subconscious and no way out. Mm -hmm. Because there's always more, more, more. Even doing shadow work, just constantly digging, digging, digging without the descent of this supermental force, the divine, to also integrate the, the spiritual view, the divine, to connect to something higher. So yeah. it's again the ascend and descend at the same time. On the opposite of the coin, like Westerners can easily fall into... Um, what John Wen will, well would call spiritual bypassing. We had an episode on that in the New Age Distortion and Spiritual Bypassing where we use spiritual concepts or get addicted to peak experiences and avoid our basic psychological process, uh, process because we're all wounded and traumatized to varying degrees growing up in the world, the first world that's completely disconnected from nature and spirit. We all are wounded, childhood wounding, trauma wounds to varying degrees. And this needs to be addressed also with basic psych psych psychology. And it's also very interesting to note, which reminds me of John Welbert, I wrote about that article. Um, you know, in Eastern teachings, it's all about um, destroy the ego, get rid of the ego. You know, this, this pure being is, has no sense of self, right? Just to no uh, identification with anything personal and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But this can be a dangerous practice for people who are severely wounded in the Western world and have no sense of self to begin with, Yeah, who are already very insecure, right? And then they're even told, you know, every every any form of self-confidence or quote-unquote self-love is bad, so get rid of it, get rid of it. It can create even more guilt and shame and increase these wounds mm. or these, these uh, uh, yeah, the wounds basically. So it's important also through a basic psychological process to uh, establish a healthy sense of self, a healthy ego, right? Yeah, I forget who said this, but I remember reading something once that before – you destroy your ego. You actually have to develop a healthy ego to begin with. Exactly. That's that's uh, that's uh, actually two people mentioned that. I remember the mother from yeah. Sri Aurobindo. She exa exactly said that. It's almost a paradox. Before you can get rid of something, you have to build it up. Yeah, yeah. And Gurdjieff also talked about this as well. Yeah, and I think this really brings back, you know, when you're talking about spiritual bypassing. And Rekshi Ray talks about this as well, is the intention behind it. And to be honest, you know, you're going to find like a lot of people are going to get into their spiritual practice because they want to feel happy or comfortable. And that's actually the gateway. So using the retreat as an example, you know, there may be some people who are just like, I just want, you know, I want to feel happy. I want to feel better. They want to feel relief from the from their lives. Like a lot of the people who came there were dealing with some pretty recent deep traumas, which are turning points for their lives. But, you know, especially doing a retreat with you and I, like we're going to introduce to them practices that are going to bring up stuff. So even though they go in with that intention to be happy, and I did that too. I was using yoga and meditation to feel better. But ultimately, if you're sincere, doing certain practices is going to bring stuff up. So then your intention, you know, is going to have to change because if you're going into your meditation practice and each time you're like, 
I want to be happy, then every time a meditation is difficult or intense, you're going to feel like it's a failure. So eventually you're, you're going to have to be with whatever arises in, in your meditation practice and use that as like basically grist for your mill. Like that's the material that you're going to have to work with. And this is a key point that I realized where the psychological work comes in. Because you, if you're sincere in your meditation practice, things that you don't like about yourself are going to come up, ways that you're lying to yourself, things in your life that aren't in alignment with your true self. And then you're going to have to find the wound that's actually making you... Um, that's actually making you treat life this way and treat yourself this way. Deal with that on a basic psychological level. Go back and meditate. More stuff comes up. And then by dealing with it on a psychological level, and if you've dealt with it well, it's not going to arise again. But I found basically in my own meditation practice, I was definitely, I, I even consciously knew at one point that I was using a spiritual bypassing because I was like, okay, no matter what I do, I know I can just meditate for an hour. And I'm going to feel better, you know, but the frustration for me was coming that I was repeating these karmic patterns in my lives. And I'm sure as many people have experienced, the more that you repeat a p pattern, the more painful it becomes over time. You know, it's a good example is getting into if someone has a pattern of getting into abusive relationship after abusive relationship, that will get more and more painful over time. And eventually you're going to hit a wall. And I feel I, this is a really turning point. I've noticed I don't even know what to call it. But when you're basically I'm never doing that again, you know, you really have to be firm. And that's when your intention really changes. And so that's that that's really about wanting to see the truth and, and then also taking control of your own life. Yeah. And that ties into, again, what in the beginning quote about Yashanti, you know, the true impulse towards enlightenment to an awakening requires uh, one basically being fuel for a fire without end, which means to confronting your discomfort, to engage in what Gurdjieff and other esoteric masters talked about, conscious suffering, not indulgent in suffering, not masochistically, but confronting that which you're afraid of looking at within yourself, right? And that's where the rubber hits the road because many people... Like, especially nowadays, oh, I want to awaken, I want to be a better person, you know, but then in, in quite right away, the ego hijacks it. Oh, I can, you know, by becoming more myself, I can manifest money, success, love, relationships, mm. externalizing it already, mm. right? Like making this happiness thing. Uh, and then the moment it gets difficult, right? That's, you see, what really comes down to, it's, there are tests for the seeker and you, all these tests, these uh, road of trials talked about in in all of many esoteric teachings really puts a seeker to the test of if, if he or she is truly sincere in the work mm. right because then a lot of people i see over the years start the work but then it gets really difficult um they hit a wall or they don't want to go there or they have too many what's called in esoteric science gordian knots right established of a life so they're very attached to family career and whatnot um then they stop and then basically go back, take the red pill, go back into matrix, into the into the matrix in the sense, uh, matrix behavior. So that sincerity is really, really important in integrity in the work. And we saw that the retreat, the more people are truly sincere of wanting to go, they confront without any expectations, right? Without any like attachment to an outcome, so to speak, but really being willing to see what is there within. In particular, that's the, you know, that's also where we get the support from the divine, Right to give this surrender, this sincerity, of uh, of truly engaging in that process. Now, with regards to sincerity, let's look at sincerity and and look at what it means. Because many people, you know, think of sincerity is being honest with everybody and just being your true self and authentic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there, excuse me. <clears throat> and there's some truth to it. But it's not too much sin being sincere with other people, but most importantly, how are you sincere with yourself? Yeah. You know, to, are you honest with yourself? Or can you tap how you lying to yourself, how the mind is trying to rationalize, justify, and doesn't truly want to engage in that process or try to, tries to bargain. Maybe a part of you wants to do this, but another part mm -hmm. doesn't. So there's, a, there's no unification within, mm -hmm. right? Like part of us wants this, but then we, we still... Uh, justify our indulgences of the lower nature or try to spiritualize it. We see this a lot in the quote-unquote neo-tantra movement yeah. where a lot of vital lower uh, nature impulses are being rationalized as sacred sexuality, for example. 
Yeah, and before you read that quote, I think it was in this A.A. Chalmers book, he talks about how people, you know, want to do the work, but then they want one thing to stay the same. So, like, I see this in people often, they're like, oh, I really want to engage in spiritual practice, but I still want to stay as, like, a lawyer or an engineer or whatever. But what the path may have for them may be entirely different. So the sincerity means also this deeper surrender to the divine and the path that's laid out to you. If you want one part, if your ego mind wants one part of your life to stay the same, it could literally literally derail your entire journey because that's where the sincerity comes in exactly and almas what he talked about mirrors and many other as a true esoteric teachings where they talk about sincerity and this quote i'm going to read right now is from the mother um, from Sri Aurobindo's work in integral yoga his partner she says to be sincere all the parts of the being must be united in the aspiration for the divine not that one part wants and others refuse or revolt to be sincere in the aspiration, to want the divine for the divine's sake, not for fame or name or prestige or power or any satisfaction of vanity. Sincerity is the key of the divine doors. All division in the being is an insincerity. The greatest insincerity is to dig an abyss between your body and the truth of your being. When an abyss separates the true being from the physical being, Nature fills it up immediately with all kinds of adverse suggestions, the most formidable of which is fear and the most pernicious doubt. All allow nothing anywhere to deny the truth of your being. This is sincerity. So what she says, she talks about the parts of the being must be united. And when you read it, all esoteric teachings, it's also understanding what Goethe called the machine of your being, of, of, of who you are, these different parts and the different cosmologies, you know, in integral yoga, with Sri Aurobindo, the mother, they talk about, you know, there's the physical being, the vital being of desires, lower nature, sexual impulses and passions, life force, the mental being, right, the intellect and all of that, uh, the emotional being, Gurdjieff's work also talk about the intellectual center, the emotional center, the physical center, all these are different parts. And then we have all these different eyes within us, different uh, personalities, so to speak, which we mistake for the true self. But if you really sincere in your self-observation and look deep inside, you realize that you are very, you, you are a very contradictory being because one part wants, wants one thing, but the other part wants something else. Sometimes very literally contradictions. A part of you wants to be in this amazing relationship, whatever. Another part wants to be completely alone. Mm -hmm. Another part wants this higher love and, you know, platonic connection. Another part is really dr wants, you know, dirty lusts, you know, sex or whatnot. So it's all like, you know, then we give importance, you know, we listen, like you said before, by Almas, like we, you know, agree to one part, but we're not sincere with the other part and we justify it, yeah. right? And and actually what uh, Sri Aurobindo talked, we try, try to bargain with the divine, right? Yeah. To justify our lower impulses, trying to spiritualize them. But we're not, in that moment, we're not sincere anymore. We're yeah. not united within. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I can relate to that. I mean, at certain points in my life, like I was definitely starting to become more embodied and more sensitive. And luckily, because of some astrological placements in my chart, I have no choice but to move forward sometimes. And there'll be certain trigger points which will force me out of situations which are no longer in alignment with myself. So that's almost a blessing. But for some people... Uh, they won't be as lucky and the universe will not force them out of situations which are not in alignment with the self. And that's where this deeper courage and also surrender to the unknown has to come in. So say, you know, a really popular example, you start waking up, um, you know, becoming more body, becoming more your true self and you're in a relationship with someone who um, is threatened by your own, isn't, isn't doing any work themselves really and gets threatened by your own, by your own different state of being, your own essence coming through. And you, you may be with this person for a really long time and you may have kids with them and th they may be all you know. So basically leaving the relationship would be like starting a new life, literally dying and be re re being reborn. You may be completely dependent on, or you feel you're completely financially dependent on them. But the truth is, is this, if, if you have this higher calling to leave them, that's going to be like a death and rebirth. And like this is and that's the that's 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 the scariest part is being able to let go of these major attachments we have. Yeah, it reminds me too. also, you know, this true impulse towards awakening. Who got the truth? Everything needs to be questioned. Yeah. Like not only question everything in the world, what we've been told and taught, but also questioning our own 
ideals, our own goals, aspirations, dreams, hopes, all of that, right, needs to be questioned. And many times we attach to certain um, outcomes, attach to what we have, who we are, who we think we are, right? So that's what the attach, letting go of attachment doesn't mean that, you know, that's a distortion of spirituality. Again, doesn't mean to become aesthetics in the sense of just denying the physical world, denying the world, living in poverty or whatnot, or denying the material world. That, that doesn't mean, that's not what non-attachment is about. Yeah. <clears throat> it just means questioning what is truly coming from essence, who you truly are. And awakening means about what you mentioned at the beginning, connecting to essence. And essence is your true state of of being your soul, your psychic being, and its true state is joy, which is completely independent of any external circumstances. Mm -hmm. So many of us mistake also our conditioned personality for essence. Even when you you can examine yourself, many times you feel happy, you know, and fulfilled and joyful. But is it truly coming from a state of being unchangeable, or is it actually related to something that happens externally? Mm. Because in a great vacation, you're at the beach, or something great happened to you, you fell in love, or you have, you got praise, or some money, or you bought something, or anything that is fulfilling you for externally, bringing you joy or happiness, is not a deeper joy or fulfillment from an essence level, which... It doesn't mean to imply that we shouldn't, like, you know, enjoy the outside world and enjoy whatever, but it's a, a deep and non-attachment and not making our state of being dependent on external circumstances. And that is the true work, because as long as we have holes within us, we try to fill it externally through relationship stuff, experiences, whatever it may be. Yeah, in fact, you touched on, this is also another thing um, that A.H. Almas talks about, you know, uh, our essence is filled with holes and anywhere where we're grasping or looking for something outside of us actually is a really great learning opportunity to show us where these holes are. So, you know, and if I'm looking for validation, you know, like what is what is validation uh, looking for? A sense of worth. So that's where I have a hole in my essence to, to to have to know that I'm missing something. And it's not about, you know, shaming yourself for looking for validation outside, but just to know that there's a sense of worth inside you, which needs to be developed. That's why you're looking for it outside of you. So anything that you're grasping and looking for you outside of you actually points to where, where you need to work on next. You can use, you can use these holes and the way that we basically look for holes, out, look to fulfill our holes outside of us through like media, culture, entertainment, food, yeah. uh, to show us where, what essence we're missing and what we need to develop next. Yeah. And Posting selfies, getting dopamine like hits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, know you, I know you don't like selfies. <laughs> so let's also, I want to touch on to this idea of like self-deception and lies to the self. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to, um, yeah, definitely touch upon that. But I want to go back also to the, the quote you just read by the mother because she's uh, in the second paragraph where she mentions, um, when she talks about all the vision in the being is an insincerity, the greatest insincerity is to dig an abyss between your body and the truth of your being. When an abyss separates the true being from the physical being, nature fills it up immediately with all kinds of adverse suggestions mm. and so forth. So what that also means from an esoteric or cold perspective, wherever you are insincere, right, there's a division, separation between your true being, mm. there's a crack, there's an opening where also cold forces can tag into. And totally. they take advantage of your weaknesses, of your blind spots, of your insincerity to tempt you back into your mechanical behaviors, your attachments, your, your addictions, your matrix behaviors of maybe whatever uh, fame, money, greed, lust, whatever it may be, um, to, t to keep you in your false self, right? To keep you in this lower matrix frequency of ego identification and lower nature and all of that. Yeah. So in that sense, these... Attacks can then also, from an esoteric perspective, be seen as a trial of strength, as a test of sincerity. Literally, these interferences are a test of sincerity. How sincere are we truly, right? Because I've noticed whenever I'm subjected to, the att to these attacks, or we both have been, there has been some sort of crack, you know, some sort of division within us or lack of awareness where a part of us hasn't been fully sincere, right? Yeah. And true sincerity also means um, being impeccable. Right, in terms of really applying what we know at all times, because many times we read, you know, spiritual memes on Facebook that inspire us, or books and quotes, 
and we resonate with it on a deep level and see the truth, even the quotes I'm citing right now, but it's mostly intellectually, you know, there's a deeper resonance with maybe uh, the soul level, but it's more an intellectual grasping, but not an embodied understanding of truly applying it in everyday life. Because how many times have you read something that's true, but then you go about your life and forget about it and you get triggered or whatever happens and you don't apply it. Right. Yeah, and that's where the rubber hits the, the road, road and the real work comes in. And it's also important to know um, with this, uh, it ties into this topic of impeccability, you know, being impeccable. So uh, a good example is you can, like A.H. Almas gives this example. So say you want to work on a certain area of your spiritual work. So you want to work on disidentification with your emotions for instance so you really are impeccable every time an emotion comes up you try not to identify with it until you develop mastery over it so look at how hard even just tackling that one area would be and to develop impeccability with it and that's where this sincerity comes in you know and then once you reach a certain stage like of, of, of working with that, you'll know when you develop mastery, when you don't have these moments of like falling back into the cracks or whatever, that's when you know when you've actually achieved what you're trying to achieve. For instance, like the past, I don't know, five years or so, like I've been really working on meditation, but even yet so, like even though I've, you know, I'm, I can do a daily meditation practice, also use meditation practices in the world, I know I could also deepen my meditation practices. So there's always deeper to go and that sincerity is key. A lot of people, this is called like mic mindfulness, they use meditation to just focus. So 11 minutes a day, just doing that so they can be better at their corporate job. They're actually not sincere with their meditation practice because you're really sincere with your meditation practice. You're going to keep taking it deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, not to say you have to keep doing that every single day but when you're ready be like okay what's the next stage how can i how can i um create, take this to the next level and it's really common too like they they describe right before buddha became enlightened he basically became attacked by the these demons these these female demons and they were attachment greed desire and passion so at any point in your life when you're starting to awaken you're going to be tested with these with these basically demons that are going to come in the form of um really uh alluring offers you know like riches maybe an ex-boyfriend from your past comes back into your life who's not so good for you like these are examples that come in these are these tests for you as well so um yeah it really it really comes into being able to spot where you're deceiving yourself and where you're lying to yourself and that these are the hardest lies to detect is and and sometimes that's also why we need mirrors of, of other people who can point it out to us. But the thing is, it's like no one knows your internal world as well as you do as well. So these lies to the self, although they're the hardest to detect, once you can start detecting them, that's a really good sign. And then the next step when you can start detecting them, it's one thing to detect where you're lying to yourself, but then to act on that lie. Yeah. So here's the, here's the paradox uh, in the sense the more you're truly sincere with yourself, the more you realize how insincere you actually are, mm -hmm. which means the more you realize how you're lying to yourself. And like you mentioned from an esoteric perspective, lies to the self are not only the most harmful, but the hardest to detect. So they have a more self-observation to be more, uh, taking full self-responsibility, radical self-honesty with oneself, being very fully sincere with oneself. We discover more how we're insincere the different parts that act almost independently, mechanically. We become face-to-face uh, -face of our mechanical nature, how mechanically we are, how conditioned and programmed and wounded we are, how we actually have no free will, right? But we are so mechanically driven and filled with addictions and distractions and all of that. So, you know, with this sin sincerity, um, we face um, the lies within ourselves. And you've also noticed... You know, in, in the beginning, you easily can rationalize away things, yeah. rationalize your lies. And like you said, sometimes you need a mirror, but in a mirror, in a sense, also not like pointing out, like helping each other to become aware of our mechanical behaviors. Yeah. You know, and even at the retreat in the group process, we help people make aware of certain things by helping them to tune into their body, what's feelings for them to discover themselves. That's the best mirror in the sense to what's going on. Yeah. So they discover themselves. 
for this holistic approach of like, okay, it's tuning into your body and what emotion are you feeling? What story may be attached and helping them sink deeper so they realize it themselves, mm -hmm. right? So that's how we can assist and help each other. But going back to the sincerity, I re you realize the more than also you're sincere with yourself, yes, you become aware of the lies you're telling yourself, but the deeper you go and you're truly sincere, the less you're able to lie to yourself and your true conscience emerges, yeah. right? The less you'll be able to blame out anybody outside yourself for how, however you're doing situations people and whatnot the more you take self-responsibility yeah. right and the, that brings you closer to essence to the divine that's the door but that process is not an easy process because mm -hmm. confronting the lies in the self the ego doesn't like it the mm -hmm. ego doesn't like to acknowledge and you know that okay i'm actually not that humble i'm not that loving i have all this hate and anger and mm -hmm. shame and guilt and hate within me like who wants to acknowledge that but once you own that right mm -hmm. and really feel through it that's uh, apply that relates to what um uh, Gurdjieff have talked conscious suffering but then there's a breakthrough and confront your fears and wounds and uh, work through it emotionally that's how you clear um all the debris all the blockages all the armor that's just in the way of of your essence and and the connection to the divine and again i want to uh quote Gurdjieff here if i find this about sincerity Um, hold on. Can you take over? I can't find it. Right now. <laughs> like just, yeah. Just comment on what I said. And like, yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, no. And I can relate. I was just thinking again, like, for instance, if someone comes to me and they say, this is really common, by the way, like I see this so often and you see it too in your coaching practice. We're like, oh my God, I'm like waking up. I'm becoming my true essence. My partner isn't doing so. And neither of you, like we know, we're not ever going to tell anyone to leave your partner, basically. But I do give them the advice because I've gone through this experience myself. Is like, there's going to, if you're really working on becoming your true self, there's going to be a, become a point where it will be too painful to stay in that situation if that if it's not right for you. And that relates to not just relationships, but any situation as well. So as you develop your essence, um, And being in your essence, if your external situation is built off of your false personality, there's going to come a point where it's too painful for you to stay in that situation. And this is also, this is also ties into what you said. It's going to be harder to lie to yourself. You know, you're, you can lie to yourself as much as you want in your mind, but if you're really engaged in this embodiment process and becoming more and becoming more of your true essence in an embodied way, eventually, eventually you're going to feel, you're going to be like, oh my God, this does, this, this feels awful. Like it will just feel basically completely wrong to put it, to put it simply like, To get just to give an example, and I and I know that like the thing with like this is also ties into like this idea of humility as well, which is really important. I think we talked about on certain podcasts is being able to, to like the things that you're going to get the most triggered by about yourself are usually the things that are going to be the most true as well. So that's that's a good way to tell if you're lying to yourself if. It's like, it's a simple process of doing shadow work that we did at the retreat. We gave people a list of words that most people would never want to be called. And it's like, okay, which words trigger you? And that actually points to a place where their shadow is. So I think you found the quote that you wanted to read. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to paraphrase it because Gurdjieff also talked about the more sincere you are, the more you will suffer. Mm -hmm. You will be confronted with suffering. Because you will be confronted with all the things you have avoided looking at all your life or even lifetimes that will come up to surface, right? Um, but it's very important to understand, again, that this topic of sincerity from an esoteric perspective doesn't... We always imply it and people mistake it, Einstein, like, I need to be sincere with everyone, just be honest and authentic with everyone, right? But from an esoteric perspective, Gurdjieff talked about clever sincerity, and clever insincerity, which is very important. There can be what he called stupid sincerity and stupid insincerity, which is very mechanical and, and, and people engage it because they are sincere from the conditioned personality and not really you know, speaking from essence. So clever sincerity, meaning you need to be very sin most often sincere with yourself mm -hmm. and sincere with people who are also engaged in the work of your teacher to not you know, lie to them, not to lie to yourself. 
to be really authentic in the process to bring everything open in the on the table. But there's also clever insincerity, and there's something uh, Gurdjieff said which really struck me. He said sincerity with every everyone is actually a weakness, mm. and that he relates to. Um, in regards to also being externally considerate, which means also being cleverly insincere and, and being externally considerate means when you do the work, you need to also protect yourself from what is called in esoteric science, from the Christian, esoteric Christian perspective, from the general law, the matrix to protect yourself from these forces. Yeah. So you need to, uh, you know, also be silent, which is, or hide, hide in, or build your quote unquote cage, your protective, you know, shell, so to speak, so you don't become sincere with everybody about your process with people who are sleeping, who can be used as forces against you. Yeah. So from this esoteric perspective, it's even fine to tell the quote-unquote white lies in yeah, order yeah, to yeah. protect yourself, in order not also respect other people's level of being. And from the good view or that esoteric perspective, uh, being externally considered, meaning through your own work and level of being you can tune into other person's level of being to adjust to their quote-unquote world your level of being level of consciousness you know which entails even supporting their illusions if they don't ask mm, for it to yeah, respect yeah. their free will yeah right and not impose onto them not to force them to wake up and not to share about your own work which they would even relate to and understand and also most importantly to protect yourself because you have to understand from this mode matrix or call perspective anybody who's asleep anybody who's not sincere engaged in this in the in the great work can be used as an organic portal-like matrix agent where these forces work to it, uh, through them to divert you from the path. Yeah, and um, a good example of this, which I think a lot of people might be able to relate to, is when you start truly like living your purpose and being what you're passionate about, a mistake I made is sharing it to people who basically weren't doing that. And as many people have probably experienced, when you're living your purpose, really living your passions, where as they're going along with the program of what their parents told them to do, what the matrix told them to do, they will be threatened by it and they will try and put you down for what you're doing. So I learned very quickly, like I was sharing it with everyone. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, just basically this stupid sincerity or whatever you call, what did you call it? Uh, Stupid, yeah, that's stupid sincerity. Yes, yeah, so a stupid sincerity, and then realizing because they would basically attack me or say I was stupid, it would hurt me because I was being sincere with the wrong people. So now I've learned to adjust what I say to who I'm saying based on where they're at. And it's just a, it's just a way to protect it. It's like not everyone, you know, you need, it's like similar to what Brene Brown talks about. She has this great, even though it's like on Netflix, super mainstream, this really great talk about vulnerability on there. And the people that you're, she, she makes a note that the people who you're going to be truly vulnerable with are going to be like maybe like two people max. Like that's the people who you can be totally honest and vulnerable with. And these are people that exist in your safe container. But at the retreat, for instance, we made that container quite big. So that there's obviously exceptions to that. But and then everyone else, you know, like they people need to also earn the right to be to be a part of like these most sacred parts of yourself in a sense, because it's 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 really a privilege as well to really know that part of you. And then you also have to honor it. Like they, they have to honor that part of yourself. And if people aren't willing to honor it, then sorry, they don't belong in there. Like you can relate to them where they're at. It doesn't mean you need to be disrespectful. It doesn't mean you need to especially be like, oh, I'm more woke than you. I'm not going to talk to you about this. It's just meeting them where they're at. And that's where this deeper level of really connection comes in. It's not, I, I made also the mistake too, is uh, see, thinking that everyone, this is really stupid now that I'm looking back, but thinking because I was having these amazing spiritual experiences that everyone else was also having those same experiences, which is ridiculous to think because that's not, you know, everyone's on their different soul path, different part of their ev own personal evolution. But I projected qualities into people that weren't there based on how I was feeling, which is a very solipsistic way of thinking as well. So um, yeah, that ties also into what I think we talked in the last, Last podcast about shadow, no, one of the, maybe the one previous shadow work about positive shadow projections, mm -hmm. not understanding le different levels of being and that everybody has even the quote unquote uh, seed, it ties into organic portal soul as humans who are not even wired to um, even understand, comprehend or uh, drawn to higher knowledge or esoteric knowledge, spiritual knowledge. It's just where they're at in an evolutionary state of, uh, of being mm. and who can be used as matrix agents. 
And it also, you know, I made the same assumptions, especially when I got into deeper research of what's going on in the world. Like, you know, why wouldn't anybody interested be in aliens? Of course, we're not alone, <laughs> right? And of course, we're being lied to. It's obvious there's more to this world and universe and life than what we've been told and taught. Yeah. You know, history is very distorted. Like, it was so obvious for me at the, at the beginning. Yeah. And so, I... And I think a common mistake that people make is like they find out this knowledge, they go home to family for Thanksgiving, they try and drop truth bombs on their uncle, you know, and they're like, and, and, they, and they realize that that's not the person that they should be sharing this information to yeah. as well. And I think, um, you know, I think we only have a few minutes left. That kind of ties into this whole like woke culture as well, you know, like it's like woke culture i feel is like a function of the ego where it starts identifying with this as spiritual experiences and then developing a superiority complex around it so when we start to and and i definitely fell into this trap you know and i have to admit it was based on my own woundedness of wanting to feel basically i felt like i wasn't good enough so therefore i developed an ego complex where i felt that i was better than other people special yeah, special, exactly. And um, but now more and more as I develop my own spiritual process, I realize that I can see myself in a lot of people who maybe formerly I may have judged and thought were, were like different than me or not the same. Like it's about this connection. And also, you know, once you become more of your essence, you can spot the essence in other people, even though it may be shrouded to their own conscious mind, basically. So you can see the true self in other people, even if they're disconnected, even if they're disembodied. And it has nothing to do with being more spiritual or more awake than them. It's just you can see it in them. You can see that seed in them because that's what's your that's what you're connecting to people from. Yeah. And so this process of Awakening not only entails obviously to confront yourself, the lies you tell yourself and the shadow aspects and all of that, different parts within yourself, the conditioning, programming, but ultimately it's interrelated, which we also talked in a previous uh, podcast, confronting the lies in the world and mm. the matrix control system and the darkness in the world, which can be very, um, how can I say, disturbing. Yeah. Right, it's very disturbing when when you really dive deeper down the rabbit hole, because it goes way beyond. Many people, maybe most people, are aware, you know, think they're awake because they see through the lies of the government, like I mentioned before, nine eleven, vaccinations, maybe even geoengineering, five G, GMOs, chemtrails, yeah. you know, and all of that. But that's really like the superficial surface of what's yeah. going on. Are merely symptoms. When you dive deeper, you go into in maybe secret societies you get into pedophilia sexual ritualistic abuse elite pedophile rings very horrific abuse and control mechanisms mk ultra and then you go, dive even deep into the hyperdimensional matrix of cold forces and all of this deeper suffering and when the more you work on yourself also and tune into your inner suffering the more you actually also tune into the suffering of the collective right to really feel that as well yeah. That's part of the process because it's all you to begin with. And it's mm -hmm. not about wallowing in it. It's about transmuting it, about bringing the light to the dark, uh, light into the darkness and not shying, shying away of it because that's how many people get also caught up. They separate the the work like they only focus on the self or especially new age approach, love and light and deny the darkness and just focus on love and light or project love and light into the world, meditation on meditate, mass meditations on love and peace and whatnot. But it will, it will never fully anchor itself if we don't truly face the dark as well and bring it all into the light, meaning bringing it to awareness to look at it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it really also, it's a twofold process. So you will be also confronted with, all the horrors in the world, you know, you cannot uh, not look at it anymore. It's a law of ascend and descend. You can only rise as high as as deep you go into the shadows as well. And eventually you will also be confronted with uh, occult forces, which are definitely targeting people who are uh, especially on the verge of a true awakening. Yeah. They come in, they don't want to lose their food source. They want to keep you in the lower frequency. They will tempt you away through distractions. That's again a test of sincerity. That's why I mentioned at the beginning, many people may start to walk the path, but then the <clears throat> first difficulty appears and then they give up on it. They give in to the weaknesses, right? Instead of really being truly sincere and have the integrity to, you know, as Adyashanti said, to be the fuel for this fire, to transmute, to burn away all that is not true, right? So 
in the second hour, we can maybe talk about more of um, the matrix, what's going on there on, yeah. the, on these deeper levels or, uh, in, in the external world, so to speak, the occult forces and how this relates to, to our inner process. Exactly. And then some other things um, we wanted to touch on, which we didn't have a chance to touch on in this hour is what is the truth? Talking about some universal laws, more about sincerity, integrity, the law of intent, you know, what is driving why we want to awaken uh, these full enlightenment experiences, peak experiences, and I'm sure we'll come up with much more. But definitely going into this, um, you know, this is also ties into this topic. Uh, do you really want to awaken is, um, you know, we live in the Kali Yuga, as they say, we're in a period of immense darkness right now. And there is stuff going on in the world, um, which you're going to have to wake up to, you know, if you want to see the truth. There's going to be stuff that are going to is going to truly disturb you and it's going to be in your personal life and it's going to be in the collective. And this is actually what we need to see. And these are actually the best times for spiritual awakening to happen. Like the night is always darkest before dawn, as they say. But in order to, you know, in order to see the truth, we actually have to be able to not be afraid to look at what's there and not be able to not be afraid of talking about certain topics. So, yeah, that's definitely more we can go into that more in the second hour of the podcast exactly and then we also want to talk about the so-called truth movement and it's how it's important to shine light and there's many great activists to talk about what's going on in the world but i've noticed you know i've been part of you know spoken of various conferences but there's this really lack of this inner work right and completely externalizing so again it brings it's important to combine the work which again you know, what was was a subject of a, of a previous podcast, the uh, um, importance of both in and outer work. But yeah, in the second hour, we go deeper into these topics as well. And again, if you want to, if you're not already a member, sign up to the membership at my website, veilofreality.com. It also gives you access to our membership forum. It's really active, a lot of people sharing, and it's a safe uh, place and space to share your experiences and share with others, learn from others. And also gives you access to our monthly Zoom call we have now. Mm. You know, we have like once a month, we offer a live Zoom call. We post a link on the forum and talk about certain topics and we can discuss, people can share, you can meet each other on screen. It's really nice to see each other face to face, so to speak. And um, yeah, and that's that see you guys in the second hour